Okay, so realistically, how can we begin to defund if not dismantle the police service? I think Varun has gone into a, a good amount of detail on this, and of course, um, Nadine's talked about it as well. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I think there are quite I think we can have we can have kind of strategic campaigning against prevent against the gangs matrix against the use of tasers against um uh, having more police in schools which already exists like this. the bandwidth's gone down down um okay i'll just talk as clearly and as badly as possible and hopefully it'll be okay um so uh, as arun and nadine um, have already mentioned there are clear campaigns that have attempted to that are attempting to erode specific police powers and police resources and forms of police um uh, legitimacy, whether that be prevent or the gangs matrix, or um, there are campaigns, particularly in the north of England, to stop uh, police in schools. There's other campaigns in the north of England, such as the, um, the um, Northern Police Monitoring Project, which are challenging the collection of biometric data um, in cities like Manchester and Leeds. So these are practical ways in which um, uh, people are trying to attempt to erode the power um, that the police have and the expansion of police power. But of course, the other practical way of doing it is are the provide, is the provision of services for people um, so that they don't end up coming into contact with the police in the first place. So again, Arun mentioned youth services are a great way to work with vulnerable and oppressed um, young people before they come into contact with the police and prison system. And so again, this um, prevents the power and influence that the police have. So there are lots of really good examples, I, I think, of this. Um, in terms of drawing the links between the police, board and arms industry, um, without being a cop out and saying conversations like this are really useful for that, um, I think in practical terms, I, I think a lot of the ways in which CATS has tried to do um, it's work more recently by in, in its kind of occupation and um, process protest outside of the arms fair, but bringing in people who do work um, against policing and borders and thinking about in practical ways those things are linked. I think is really important as well. And I think we're we're, we're starting to see in really practical ways how the police are using for, uh, military forms of technology, military tactics. Um, um, militaristic language and discourse, you know, the war on terror, the war on gangs, the war on drugs, all of these types of things. And I think so about, I think it's about making those connections as we're seeing already, whether it be discursively, practically through our, our activist actions, um, and, um, and through the kind of um, the conversations we're having as well. Um, I think can be, uh, I think, I think a continuation of that could, could um, uh, be further fruitful, I, I hope. Um. I'll just say quickly, I, I mean, for me, um, the, the most, so the first thing I would say on this is, is we're not going to make progress um, unless we are able to build something that goes beyond like the kind of narrow circles of, of committed activists that are already kind of doing the work and that goes beyond um, the sort of small circle of people in universities who, who are, you know, kind of thinking already along the lines of abolitionism or whatever. We've got to find ways that, that we can, um, can, you know, it translate the, the kinds of conversations we're having into um, something that makes sense to, to a broader mass of people, right? Um, that's going to be easier to do with some parts of the population than others, but even, even amongst racialized groups, it's, it requires a, a large amount of, um, kind of political organizing work, right? Um, simply, um, you know, kind of creating some kind of organization that, um, uh, you know, puts out statements and demands saying we want to abolish racial capitalism, we want to abolish the police, we want to abolish prisons isn't really actually going to get us very far. Um, so so the, the, the kind of question is, is, you know, like, we need to start with where we're already at, and, and start with um, the the campaigns that organically spring up anyway, right? Um, those individual cases where there's, um, you know, a, a community that feels that this individual case needs to be taken up, we, we start from that and, and build up from those um, individual cases, turn those into broader causes, and from those broader causes, we build up into a broader movement, right? Um, and, and I think it's, it's important to kind of, um, just always keep that in mind 
um, that, that you know, we need to start where people are at and then organize those people, right? And it's just hard, long, difficult work. There's no, there's no shortcut around that. Organizing means building a sense of collective agency, right? And, and you know, one of the questions that, um, you know, that, that came up, I think, in this thing was, is how do we, um, how do we overcome, I forget the exact wording, but something like how do we overcome our fear of, you know, the kind of powerful forces of the government or whatever, and what is it that powerful forces like corporations or governments, what can make them fearful of us, as it were, right? And, and really the only thing they fear is, is our capacity to come together at, um, in our own organizations and have the collective strength um, to, to act as a mass of people rather than just atomized individuals. Um, and the fear that, you know, the fear that exists of, the, of going against power, right? That is scary. It's, it's never, you, you never overcome that fear. But what you do is by building organization, you act in spite of the fear, right? And that's the key thing here. Um, and the more that we're connected together, the more that we're organized, um, the less isolated we are, the easier it is for us to, to act um, in spite of the potential um, fear of, of, reper of repercussions and so forth and the capacity of the state to oppose those. Um, so you know, it's just the short answer is it's just that long hard work of building of you know building relationships with people who aren't already in this um, line of thinking and and get and um, connecting with them and and building something that goes beyond the narrow circles of the, um, that we start off with. I do want to add when we think about <clears throat> building uh, alliances across uh, the globe and like thinking about Kashmir, thinking about the movements in US. So very recently what happened, just thinking in terms of like the globality of this all, very recently what started happening in the Arab world, so to speak, like United Arab Emirates, uh, Dubai and uh, you know, other places as well, even Saudi Arabia for that uh, matter, that they started, uh, there, was, there was a wo woman activist writer who's, a, who's an Arab, uh, they chanced upon some tweets that were being tweeted by Indians who are in these Middle Eastern countries. And they are Islamophobic, they are, uh, you know, writing against their society, and they started focusing on them. And then it kind of became bigger because uh, these activists, these Arab activists, they kind of started realizing how much Islamophobia and how much uh, anti-Muslim um, sentiment exists in the Indian population. And this Indian population, they're mostly expatriates in these countries, earning money, sending, sending big remittances back. They're also industrialists. They're big CEOs. Uh, so they started kind of paying attention to that. And part of that conversation, the anti-Muslimness, Islamophobia also became the Kashmir situation. And suddenly, uh, Kashmiris, because uh, they didn't have internet, but once they got the partial internet, the 2G, which is just text-based, some of them started uh, building on these tweets and connecting to these people. And then uh, many Kashmiri activists felt very hopeful. They thought that the Islamic world was finally uh, rising to this idea of uh, Kashmir uh, being a problem, it, uh, because they have a good relationship, most of the uh, Arabian countries. Uh, Arab countries and most of the other Middle Eastern countries, they are they have a good relationship with uh, India. And uh, last year, when the lockdown, the siege of uh, when the siege was imposed on Kashmir, uh, one of um, uh, Modi, uh, the Prime Minister, he also was felicitated by one of the highest honors uh, in UAE or or maybe Saudi Arabia. I don't remember which one. So, anyways, so all of this was becoming very hopeful, and people were thinking about collective movements. People were thinking about, oh, you know, we can create these activist linkages now that we have these uh, Muslim people rising up to the Islamophobia, rising up to the anti-Muslimness. So probably the Indian Muslims will have allies and then uh, probably um, Kashmiri Muslims will have allies. And simultaneously what's been happening in the past one year or two years is this uh, I think it's called the Caracol, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's one of the arms um, producers in, uh, they produce small carbines and things like that in the UAE. 
and they have been in uh, can, they have been in talks with the Indian Defense Ministry and all of that, and there have been some they have undermined their deals every now and then. But very recently, uh, there came the news that they will be buying the carbines from this company, from UAE. And these are carbines that probably are going to be replaced, uh, replacing uh, the guns that are in Kashmir. So now as people are becoming hopeful of this, I feel like many people do not know these kind of deals. Uh, they, they do not know the connection between, I mean, activists might go a long way in trying to sort of make these social media connections and thinking about this, but at the same time, these, these deals are happening between state powers. And I feel like uh, people in Kashmir, people in especially South Asia, not here, so to speak, haven't made these connections as to how we kind of have to think and also contextualize these situations, these, 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 these sales and trade of arms and how they are big in these relationships and they make small whatever little connections people are trying to make and they undermine it basically in the long run. Now, when these guns are going to come into Kashmir, uh, several programs and several journalists who are kind of speaking about Kashmir and Islamophobia in these countries, I just don't see the balance there. And I feel like one of the biggest things that needs to happen, especially in South Asia, and not here is the connection that that not only between people's movements but also how uh, the nation states are conversing with each other especially through uh, trade of arms and ammunition and i feel like that should be a bigger part of conversation when kashmiris are speaking about activism and kashmiris are speaking about making connections with larger collectives yeah just briefly i was gonna say that um yeah i i appreciated what aaron said about um organizing and I think there was also a question that was asked around examples of organizing and like one of the groups or sort of um, instances where I have felt quite um, um, devastated at this sort of inability or, or difficulty in organizing has been um, the Muslim population in Britain particularly around what happened at Grenfell and 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 I mean of course politically organizing um, uh, you know, as a Muslim is very difficult in Britain, precisely because of some of the things that we've all been talking about in relation to the war on terror, the construction of any kind of um, political action um, by Muslims as being kind of putting them into the category of a terror suspect. And so really you become silenced and you become really unable to, um, to kind of raise your head um, above the parapet and kind of say like, this is what we're experiencing, this is what's happening. And that's been for me, one of the most devastating things around Grenfell is kind of feeling that um, there's an inability to speak um, because of the way in which Muslims are every day um, demonized and constructed as 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 necessarily um, violent or with a potential to always be violent. But one of the things we saw in the wake of Black Lives Matter, which I thought was a really brilliant example of a kind of um, really powerful connecting the dots anti-racist coalitional politics was the action that the that 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 this that the survivors did where they um, uh, projected onto the tower um, uh, the words we we can't breathe um, in kind of recognition um, of the, the 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 same racial state violence that um, led to the deaths of their loved ones and their last words were exact were, were are very much connected to the kinds of violence although um, it's a slower form of violence that, that the sort of state abandonment and neglect that led to their deaths and um, it, it, it's it's the same it's the same source of violence, even though it's but it's harder to, to decipher. It's harder to see because it doesn't happen um, in the sort of fast way in which a police killing or a police shooting occurs and that we can kind of more easily put our finger on as kind of state violence. And so I was really, um, really um, lifted to kind of see that really what I thought was like an extremely powerful um, action. But of course, what's also so sad at the same time is that family members were saying for years, we felt like we couldn't say anything. Um, and that if we said something, if we made, if we said that we felt that racism was relevant in the deaths of our loved ones, um, um, we wouldn't be listened to and we wouldn't get justice. So again, it's about um, 
it's about, I think it's about not staying silent. Um, it's about, it, it's about not waiting for the state to deliver some kind of justice through, through an official inquiry that is actually in and of itself in its terms, leaving out the question of race and the question of stigma around social housing, um, and which can never deliver, um, 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 justice, um, but about really making our demands. Because I think if we leave it to people with platforms, if we leave it to people, um, who, or, who kind of jump on the bandwagon of Black Lives Matter because they hold some kind of political sway, we are going to end up with a kind of campaign that I saw reported, for example, in The Guardian today around um, a load of historians and, 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 and anti-racist kind of scholars signing some letter which are, are asking for the, for the UK citizenship test to be corrected for the mistakes that it makes around Britain's history. I mean, if that's what Black Lives Matter is gonna bring us, the correction of you know, details around the British Empire and the abolition of slavery in, in, in the citizenship test, um, then we are really in trouble because what we should be demanding is um, you know, an, an end to the Home Office, an end to borders, an end to border violence, uh, uh, and not, uh, uh, you know, so this this very system of racial exclusion, just the the the, the notion that it that it might be an anti-racist move to correct um, um, the its expression of historical detail in the test, which is essentially a test designed to prevent anybody who doesn't have perfect English from um, being included within this British imperial space. Yeah, I'm. I think what you say about Grenfell is very true, especially because um, I think this has been mentioned quite a few times before, but yeah, the company responsible for the cladding at Grenfell also supplies materials for F-35s. And so these links aren't even ones that are, you know, very abstract um, links that, you know, we're trying to make. They're very um, concrete and obvious links in which um, these corporations and state um, actors are killing people, um, yeah, in, in different ways, but through the same mechanisms in a, in a sense. Um, I think just, I don't know if this, well, I'm just gonna, because there was a question about arms production, I don't know if it's okay if I just um, give two like great examples in terms of resistance. Um, and I think they, they uh, give, they also like add to what Arun was saying about like not preaching to the converted. And um, yeah, I, th I think they're, they also speak to the notion of global descent. So one is um, the examples of workers in the 1970s who were working in the Rolls-Royce factory in Scotland who black marked uh, Rolls-Royce fighter jets that were being sold to the Pinochet regime in Chile. And they formed, it was an, like, there's a, there's a film that I would recommend um, if anyone has the chance to see it called May Pass Around um, to watch it of like, they formed amazing links of solidarity, but they essentially did it through um, working on their complicity um, uh, and yeah I think that's a, a, a really 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 powerful example and also throughout the film you see how like the very 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 real consequences of, of what they did um, and like how it essentially saved lives and the second one is quite a recent one of like um, people at European ports activists and campaigners um, uh, like workers refusing to um, load ship um, arms that were being sold that were being passed from like Canada to yes the European um uh, the stopping at European ports all the way to Saudi Arabia that were going to be used in Yemen and that's a really really oh, another like obvious way in which worker solidarity um it's a very concrete way in which people have like resisted the very actual like um transfer of arms 